Meneer Joost Stredom, um, really honored to be in Oranje. Uh, I have to first add a disclaimer by apologizing to everyone watching. We had like the greatest tour today, thanks to Joost. Uh, so I'm probably going to be biased uh, at the beauty of this town and the development. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and be as objective as I can be. I'd like to apologize for my team. Uh, they, they're very professional. They like doing high quality work, which makes sure that we look pretty out yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, it takes time. So we end up sitting up for like an hour, hour and a half, etc. Mm. Uh, with that being said, I'd, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart, the whole team as well, your hospitality, the friendliness of the people of Orania, the amazing food we've had and the history lessons and the many aha moments we had while we were driving around. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to you and everyone in Orania. Um, on behalf of everyone who's going to be knowing about you for the first time, hearing about the town for the first time, fighting the propaganda they've heard about being a white only, it's racist, mm -hmm. Black people are not allowed. I'm going to try and ask questions as if I've never been here and I've never done research. So mm -hmm. I hope you'll indulge me in that. And I hope that's fine. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing that I would like South Africans and viewers of this program to have, it's aha moments. If that is the only thing that we achieve today, I'm happy. Just one or two or three aha moments yeah. can change the course of history. So let's do more of those. Thank you. If we can start with the history of Oranya, how this town came to be, um, how we got to be here today? Mm. So if you ask the question of the history of Orania, you have to consider at least two histories, um, but actually a whole lot more. Mm. And the two histories I'm referring to is Orania, the physical place, which is a town established in the 60s as a, as a camp for people, engineers, builders, construction workers working on the Van der Kloof Dam and the channel systems flowing out of that. Yeah. It was a project to make the Orange River sustainable, which boosted the economy of the Northern Cape and developed agriculture in a sense that I think few people understand the, 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 the size, the gravity of that yeah. development. And then there's another history. It's the history of the Orania idea, as I like to call it now. Although Orania is a name that we adopted from the town that we bought. So, okay. so the, the idea actually existed long before the town. And I think the important one is the Orania idea history. Okay. So I'm going to put it in, in, in very simple terms and, um, and try to explain it as good as possible, although it's a quite a nuanced thing and um, people need to, 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 to stick with me. Yeah. Sure. But in very short terms. A no, short, please, please take your time. Yes. Short, you don't have to rush. A short history of how we came, became what we are. Yeah. I think there's always been um, different people thinking in different ways. And I'd like to consider Iranians as people having an alternative view of what solutions in this country should be, where we are and where we should be going. In the 1940s, late 1940s, an organization with the name Sabra was created. It was created as a think tank, a conservative think tank. Mm. They advised the National Party on, on some things and they, uh, there was a point where the National Party didn't want their advice anymore. Now you can ask Carl in your other interview more about that. He's, he's an expert on that field. Sure. But the short version is, Sabra said, if Afrikaners really and honestly consider themselves to be part of this continent, they should not try to rule South Africa as a party of minority rule. They should leave the peoples of South Africa to make decisions for themselves, rule over themselves. And if Afrikaners wants a place, they should go to a place where they can be a majority in their own area. And for that reason, make decisions for themselves in regards to their religion, in regards to their politics, in regards to their schools and their economy and so on. That idea did not resonate very well with the NP at that stage. Mm. And um, a lot of things happened, you know, the history of South Africa developed as it developed, but that idea never completely died down. In the 1970s, 80s, an uh, organization with the na name Oranje Werker mm. started working on the students, telling them maybe there's another option. You know, most people look at the two options. NP stays in power or ANC takes over power. Yeah. You know, that, that, that kind of music of change was already playing in the 80s very okay. loudly. Maybe there's a third option. Afrikaners do their own thing mm. on their own place. And that started, a lot of, of, of Afrikaner students started listening and understanding that. And in the late um, 1980s, there was a strong movement with that idea. Afrikaners should just have their own place where they can legally own 
their own piece of land, which they legally acquire, yeah. and where very, very importantly, they do their own labor. But we can speak a bit more about that later. And that movement grew and grew and grew. So the Orania idea, firstly, is an idea that is not a reaction to the end of apartheid. Which a lot of people assume. Which a lot of people assume. Orania yeah. as, as an idea is an idea that stands on its own feet. An idea that um, exists on its own merit. Mm. In, the, in 1988, an organization was created called the Afrikaner Vrijheidstichting, flowing mm. out directly from Sabra. Afrikaner Vrijheidstichting had this idea very strongly, and they started getting members to join them for this idea, to, to raise money, to raise funds, and to, to, to push this narrative of we should do our own work, we should build our own institutions, and we should own our own piece of land. And then Afrikaners can, can make the decisions for themselves without negatively affecting anyone. Mm. Um, Afstig, or the Afrikaner Vrijheidstichting, later become the Orania movement. So that's the same organization, got a new name. And in 1991, this little town, which is today Orania, uh, was a ghost town. It was abandoned by government after the project was finished. And it was abandoned. It stood empty. Mm. And the government tried to give it to the army or to the police. No one was interested for that as a, as a training camp or something like that. And uh, the government decided to sell it as a farm. And they published a, a little ad in the end of the Farmers Weekly saying, town for sale, buy it. And one of the local farmers said he already visualized how he's going to put his sheep in the little <laughs> plots of, every, of all the yards which already had nice wires around them and so sure. on. But um, Professor Karl Bosov and Dr. Chris Joester to intellectuals, academics, they said, listen, this is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to create a space for Afrikaners. This is our opportunity to realize this thing that we've been dreaming about for long, mm. this third option, this alternative option. And uh, they raised money. They managed to, to, to buy Urania and to start this, this project. And suddenly you have people moving, intellectuals mostly, because who moves to a place in the middle of the bloody desert? No one would, uh, unless <laughs> your, your brains are not well. So, so people left their jobs yeah. to move here. This is semi-desert. You can drive around 10, 10 kilometers out of town, you'll see it's desert. Yeah. Very hot, very cold, very, very little rain. And people moved here with nothing, no jobs, no economy, mm. nothing. So there was a stage in Urania's history where it was the highest qualified per square kilometer in the country. Because who moves after an idea? Intellectuals, yeah. academics, doctors, lawyers, uh, professors. And they moved here and they started trying to develop this. And yeah. it was, that was days of hunger and thirst. Jeez. It was not easy days, right? But you had a lot of people with a pioneer spirit mm. and with a plan, which would they very, very... Um, they believed in it with a lot of fire in them, you know. They said, we're going to do this, we're going to make it work. It wasn't as fast or as easy as people thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be easy, but it was. It took time. It's now more than 30 years later. Yeah. And um, we're still a pioneer community, but we've achieved some things that are noteworthy. Yeah. And that's why we say test us not on where we are currently. Test us on the trajectory of our growth. Yeah. So that's Urania, the idea, and Urania, the reality, sure. becoming one thing. Yes, thank you so much. I want to go a few steps back. So we go back to the 1940s. Mm. Is it 1940s with Sabra? Sabra was created in 1948. 1948. Yes. Sabra was an Afrikaner group, yeah. a think tank. Think tank. And they were saying to the National Party, which was the government at the time, we don't believe that Afrikaners as a minority should be looking after a majority of people. It's not sustainable. It won't last. So they almost foresaw yes. that this won't last, this system yeah. that you have. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, you should ask Carl a bit about that. He knows that history very, very well. Yeah. But that is in broad terms exactly what happened. Sure. They, they understood, you know, and, and especially when you go a bit onwards. Uh, Sabra was created in 48 and they went through the 50s. The first conference seminar about own labor practices, yeah. which we're going to speak a lot about today, I sure. guess, was in 1956. But especially in the 60s with the winds of change blowing through Africa, yeah. right? The famous winds, winds of change speech. Um, a, lot, a lot happened and, and they really realized that, you know, we need to be thinking alternatively. Yeah. And the, the NP didn't want that advice at that yeah. stage. Um, so we go a bit further. The National Party doesn't want to listen because people in power never want to listen, like our government today when we won them. And then 1991, this land comes up. Do you think there was any influence of 
the end of apartheid, the ANC coming into power that maybe accelerated the the movement mm. of certain Afrikaners being like, you know what, mm. what, what Sabra was foreseeing is happening. So I think this is the time to actually move yeah. now. Well, uh, Penela, you, uh, one shouldn't be uh, naive about uh, things like that. Yeah. I definitely think that there, there was a, uh, an influence sure. in, in regards to the, the, the way. Remember, that was for, before the, the, the referendum of 92. It was before the 94 elections. Sure. But, but surely a lot of people started thinking, maybe there's, it's time for an alternative. So sure. I'm not naive about that. But, uh, you know, still believing that Urania as an idea stands on its own foundation. Yeah. I can I can definitely concur and say that you know there was an influence in terms of the politics in the country. Uh, Karl Bosov, intellectual. You said Chris Uester. Chris Uester, Doctor Chris Uester. He was um, he was uh, if I recall correctly, uh, he was in, into uh, sociology. Okay. Uh, so he was he and, and also understand uh, you know the migration of people. Yeah. And that's why Urania understood that we Afrikaners needed to move to a place where we can be in our own area majority. Yeah. If you look at Afrikaners as a, as a nation in terms of the bigger South Africa, we're maybe yeah. 2 million in terms of a 60 million plus country. Yeah. So we don't have a lot of political influence, but in our own area, we can decide what language do we want in our schools? Yeah. What, what religion do we want to practice and how do we want to do things? Sure. And that we can only do if we are majority in our own area. Sure. So, so that's why these people understood those things, and they said, "Let's move to an area which, which have almost no inhabitants, yeah. which is empty, which is harsh, where people don't want to live, and let's create something there." So you say initially this town was built so that uh, skilled people could come and help build a dam. Yes, that's a, that's the prehistory of Urania before sure. it was here, and then yeah. it became a ghost town after the dam was yeah. built. People moved that section. The land project, was left. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how big is this land and? How much was it bought for at the time? Uh, so the town at that stage, I think, uh, was 800 hectares. 800 hectares? 800 hectares. Okay, a hectare is, they normally say one rugby field or so. Yeah, 100 meters by 100 meters. Okay, Yeah. 800 hectares. Yeah, 800 sure. hectares. And that was bought for 1,050,000 rands. 1,050,000? 1, this is obviously from Karl Bosov and Chris Uster. They had yes. money. They, 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 they got the money. They went to supporters of this idea and people chipped in. You know, it, it wasn't was, from their pockets. It wasn't from their pockets, no. No, no, no. Well, they obviously helped. Sure. But everyone gave what they could give. So I'm not sure about spe specifically how it worked. And sure. people then got shares in the in the community so they could resell land later on and so on. But um, for investors at that stage, sure. I don't. they didn't make a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Rania is now worth a lot more with the infrastructure and the development and things that's happening here. But at that stage, people just put in money and they hoped for the sure. best, you know. There's, a, there's rumors because I, if I'm not mistaken, um, Dr. Karl Bosov is a doctor? Uh, professor. Professor Karl Bosov is one of the descendants of Firvut. Yes. So there were rumors that, no, this was a Firvut project and Karl Bosov obviously had the money mm. and he bought this piece of land mm. uh, out of racism, etc. Mm. So the first myth, I guess, that's being passed mm. is mm. it wasn't necessarily his mm. money. It mm. was ordinary folk believing mm. in an idea and chipping mm. in. You must remember that Firvut died in 66. Okay. Uh, long, long before the, let's call it the second Urania realized, long before it. Sure. So it was 66, 76, 86, 91. Yeah. And um, um, <laughs> it's quite easy to see in the way that, especially in the pioneer years of Urania, yeah. but now later on, the way people live, they live simple lives. There's not a lot of money and riches here. Yeah. Um, it's not, um, if you if you wanted to make good business, Urania would not have been the place at that stage. Sure, it would have been better investments. If they had a lot of money, it would have been better investments Somewhere just in else. terms of commercial value. But um, so no, P Professor Karl Bosov and Dr. Chris Uist and so on. I'm sure they gave what they had. Sure, but the money was raised through events and through people chipping in, sure. getting shares. Yeah, one million fifty thousand eight hundred hectares. We fast forward like over thirty years now. Do you have any idea? how big the town is now yeah. and maybe an estimated worth? Estimated worth, I won't be able to help you if it's quite complicated with all the infrastructure, but maybe we should get an economist and try and to put a, a you know, value on that. But sure. what I can tell you is that it's just shy of 10,000 hectares, depending on what you count. 10,000. So the town has expanded over time. It's expanded. The, the guys what, have bought more land. Yes. What happens is people buy more, more land and then voluntarily make that part of Urania. Hectic. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of choices when you move to Urania. How much service delivery do you want? Uh, or do you, do you want to pay more um, municipal levies and get more services? Or do you want to move into like the more rural parts of Urania 
by very little levies and sure. do all your services yourself, sure. get your own solar power. So, sure. so it's a bit of options. But if you look at it on an umbrella, uh, it's all part of the Urania, the greater Urania. Okay. It's about, I would say about 10,000 hectares. 10,000. And we can't estimate, but I've driven around here and from 1 million, mm. I'm just thinking, I know some houses here that are worth 1 million mm. on their own. There's a fear. We speak about Israel and Palestine now. We speak about the story of Israel as a nation. Very controversial and polarizing. Oranya grows from 800 hectares to 10,000 hectares. I'm guessing part of the vision to maybe expand, where some people might mm. fear now that, you know, these guys are trying to recolonize South Africa with Oranya as a base. Mm. I mean, there's the story of Cape Independence now. Mm. Do you guys plan to expand? How big are you trying to get to? And how do you feel about Cape mm. Independence? Okay, so firstly, yes, we try to expand. We okay. wanna, we wanna, we wanna build a home for our people, you know. Sure. We wanna build a home for Afrikaners. If one million Afrikaners can live here, it would be great for us. Sure. Um, and then we'll have a region where we can make our decisions and and and, and you know do our things. Um, first of all, we have no ambitions to to take back in you know <laughs> in quotation marks take back south africa recolonize yeah. we don't have that aspirations and i hope some of the conversations that we've had today can prove that yeah if we were to try and colonize urania would not have been the way yeah i think there would have been ways to to do it through the the current structures in south africa yeah. politically economically and so on and via business and things like that the the mere fact that we choose to make things commercially and physically harder for ourselves by doing all our own labor and not misusing anyone else for their labor yeah. tells you that we are not on the path of colonization. Sure. We don't have such interests. Sure. We want a place for ourselves. And, um, and, 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 and we, we believe our definition of freedom is like a double-edged sword. Yeah. We believe to be free, no one must rule over you. And also to be free, you must rule over no one. You must not rule over, over over other peoples. Yeah, that's part of freedom. Because when you use people to to do your work, or you use them as in the old times as slaves, you yeah. become a you become a slave of that because you need that. You can't go without it. Sure. We want to be free of that as Christians and as Iranians. Yeah. Secondly, um, you know, uh, the mentality of the average Iranian is not one of a, of a large South Africa centrally ruled. It's been tried. The British tried to rule yeah. South Africa. Just go back 124 years. Sure. You know, the Union of South Africa was the first time everything was centralized. Before yeah. that, you had the Cape Colony, which was British. You had the Zulu Kingdom, the Corsa Kingdom. You have two Afrikaner republics, yeah. were republics. You had uh, things like that. You had your nomadic people traveling around. It's sure. a different picture. South Africa was just a geographical concept. It was not yeah. a centralized system. Yeah. And, um, and uh, we believe that the solution is not to try what the British did and failed, which was centrally managing South Africa. Sure. We believe that Afrikaners tried to rule South Africa from a centralist sp perspective and they failed. Yeah. Stopped, it didn't work out. And now the ANC is trying to, to, to rule South Africa from a centralist way of thinking. And they are also not doing sure. well. They're also failing, horribly sure. in some cases. And you have communities looking after themselves. So what do we see? We see a South Africa that can be a community of communities, a whole made out of parts. Mm. And we believe in that whole made of, out of parts, Afrikaners have a place. United States of America, the United Arab Emirates, federalism. Yes. You believe in something like that? So things like Cape Independence, maybe having an Oranya, bigger piece of land for Afrikaans people, and then whoever else, it could be Zulus on Ingonyama Trust land. You believe in something like that. And then self-governance, and then maybe they can feed into a, a central structure, but it doesn't govern them yeah. per se. Well, how exactly the system will look, I'm not certain. Sure. I know that I advocate for Afrikaner freedom, try to build that out. Yeah. I also advocate for other communities to go on the same route, and I try to help them. Yeah. And the people of Urania try to, to encourage such efforts. Yeah. You, I believe, you believe there's in, a future. Sorry, you believe in Cape Independence? I believe anyone who can um, uphold their own independence yeah. should have it if it's moral and ethical. Okay. They should, should, they should have it. People who are able, I believe firstly in de facto independence and then in the acknowledgement of such independence, de jure, through the courts or whatever. You should, what's, what's de facto independence? R real? Yeah. Okay. Um, so so if you, if that's, that's the Orania approach. Mm. So if you look a bit of, uh, at Afrikaner politics, there was a large voice saying 
uh, we, we must have independence. Article 235 of the Constitution guarantees it. Yeah. The, the, the Constitution guarantees nothing. You no know, human rights, not, it guarantees nothing. It yeah. just says it should be like that. Sure. Who, who, That's correct. Who gar guarantees that? No one. If there's men with guns, they can, um, they can guarantee your safety. Yeah. If there's no police to guarantee your safety, the constitution doesn't mean anything. Yeah, that's true. Urania, let me tell you a story about President Mbeki. Sure. In the early days of this idea, like in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, um, a lot of Afrikaners from different kind of camps believing in independence went to Mbeki, President Mbeki, and asked him some questions about this and so on. And this so was in the? Uh, in, it must have been in the in the in the in the early 90s he wasn't president then no he was a uh, deputy president okay. at that stage under nelson mandela yeah okay Pres ex-president sabombe okay sure and they asked him how should we approach this you know and um and they had different some of them said we we you know we are owned uh, afrikaner folk started taste for our people you know hey much for our people and he actually corrected them and he said he, he told uh, general um Fulun, he said listen general if I were you, I would create a reality on the ground and then I would continue from there on. Yeah. And he said, show me the animal. And uh, I don't know if it's an expression maybe, but it's not an expression we knew, we knew at that stage, but mm -hmm. later it was explained, show me the animal meant create a reality no one can deny. Yeah. Build something, do something, don't you know, show your fist to the world and scream, we want this, we want that. Sure. It doesn't help. Create a reality on the ground, build something. Sure. And then tell people, listen, this is 30 years later, we've built something. Yeah. Do you want to learn from us? Do you want to work with us? Are some of the ideas that we have worth shareable. So this is the Orania way. We try to create a reality on the ground. Acknowledgement and recognition will follow a reality yeah. that's already created. One of the things I'm grappling with, uh, which you and I have spoken about off camera throughout the day, um, is this concept of doing for self. Sounds very poetic, sounds very beautiful. If you look at the history of all creation, we can go to the Egyptians, the pharaohs and the pyramids. We can go to the building of the Roman Empire, can look to the Zulu Kingdom, can look to America. Almost every great nation has been built of some type of exploited labor. Whether it's slaves, whether it's their own people, like in Asia, in Asia, the Chinese almost enslaved their own people, sweatshops, etc. In Orania, your guys, your mindset is different. You're saying, no, whatever we want to build, we must build ourselves. Yeah. Otherwise, it is not in line with our principle. Yes. How, how do you get that right? Not just for white people that still maybe yearn for apartheid, mm. not just for well-off black people today. Mm. How, how do you get around this mindset of we will not ask other people to do things. We will mm. do them for ourselves. Mm. So the first thing is, <clears throat> for the viewers that, that don't know, all menial labor, all hard work, for, for that matter, all labor in Urania is done by the people of Urania. Meaning that we have broken with the system of cheap black labor, a system, I would say, created by the English in the Union of South Africa days, it's continued with in the apartheid years, yeah. and is continuing now as we speak under the ANC regime as well. The system of cheap black labor has built this country and it's sustaining it at the moment. Yeah. Urania is the only community that I know of um, that made a stand and said, we will not continue this system because it is not sustainable, it's not ethical, and for us as Afrikaners, it has negative consequences. And as Christians, we believe we shouldn't do it. Yeah. So whether it's building houses, scrubbing toilets, making gardens, anything in Urania that is labor is done by the people of Urania itself. Yeah. Um, it's a converse, it's a it's a theme that's very hard to wrap your head around if you if you come from a South African context and you don't understand it because sure. labor is so cheap in South Africa because of massive inequality it's so cheap it's not sustainable yeah okay now let's go back to your question if you understand that from Orania and it's not easy I mean there's people this it's constantly a process of evolution to understand own labor and all the philosophical and religious implications of it we yeah. refine it and refine it and refine it but yeah. we know we must do it. So if we go back to your original question, what was great that was built without exploitation? Well, it's tough to think of something so quickly. You know, the world, the economy, a lot of things is built on exploitation. Yeah. But all those empires, Roman Empire, e Egyptian Empire, the uh, American Empire maybe soon, they're <laughs> yeah. all falling. That is correct. They are crashing. And most of that is they are crashing under the weight 
and you can even say the apartheid empire if you want to, you yeah. know? Um, so you build a big castle, you build something great, but you build it on a foundation of sand. Yeah. And sooner or later, the Roman empire lasted the longest of all of those. Yeah. Sooner or later, it comes crashing down. And now if you build something sustainable, it might be small, Yeah. but it's great in the sense of family and community. Sure. It's great in the sense of the satisfaction of the work. It's great in the sense that you know what you've built, you've built with your own hands. Yeah. What you sustain, you sustain with your own hands. And then, and then the, comes the religious part. You know, we are a Christian community as well, very, very, very seriously so. You say, well, we're building something and we believe it's got eternal value. We're trying to build something with eternal value. And that then must be, it must be an offer. Uh, 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 what's, what's a the, way to tithe or yeah. give offering and service to, service. to God. Doing work with your own hand is, is an act of service. And if people today listening to this podcast, yeah. Understand one thing of Urania. It is we are different. We are, we are, by doing our own labor, we have changed the dynamic. We have changed a lot of things. You know, there was a journalist for the citizen. I don't know if you've read the story. He came for the citizen. He was one of few guys who understood this idea of doing, of own labor, and it blew his mind. Yeah. And he said, listen, but you're not apartheid. Urania is the antidote to apartheid. And he, he wrote this article for the citizen. Yeah. And he, he published the emails between me, he, him, him and, uh, and his boss. And the boss just said, the, the, the editor just said, we're not, we're not publishing this. Are you serious? I'm serious. And, he's, and they wrote emails back and forth. And in the end, he said, they won't publish this. I and know the story. I think Ernst von Sell from AfriForum shared it yes. last year. Yes. And he published it on his own. He called Urania the antidote to apartheid. So I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm just saying, yeah. if people understand that Urania is different from the two kind of sides of the coin that you have in South Africa. We're yeah. different. We're something totally, we, we're a third option. Sure. So that's Urania. And for us, something great, walking in the streets with the guy that maybe tend to your garden, is your friend. Yeah. Going to church and you sit in, and you sit in the same church uh, pews with, with the guy that uh, maybe, or the girl that maybe cleans your house, if you can afford that. Yeah. Um, you, have a, you have a personal relationship with those, those people because why you share this vision of Urania and yeah. what it must become. I, I, it's something that myself and my crew struggled with the whole day here. You hear about it, but when you see it, it looks unreal. Construction sites, the guys mixing the cement, the guys laying the bricks as white people. You see a guy who looks, you know, is wearing a nice shirt, nice chinos, working in his garden, white guy. It's, it's real. And I, I think it's important for people to hear it, even from me, that, that we saw it. Mm. We, we, you look, because you, you know, you come here with the, I want to see the black people hidden. Because mm. many people actually really believe, because they've never seen it. They've never seen a town, a home, a business where there are no black people working mm. there. And it's literally white people doing the work that is deemed menial labor. Mm. What are your opinions? And maybe this is unfair on, on job creation. So you might find certain black mm. people saying, oh, Aranya is so beautiful. Mm. They believe in self-doing. They roll up their sleeves. They do themselves. But... I don't mind earning peanuts. Just mm. give me a job. Mm. Mm. White man, I know you're trying to do the right mm. thing and I appreciate mm. it, but mm. we need jobs. We mm. want to come to Oranya. We mm. want to clean your houses. Mm. We want to cut your grass. Mm. We want to build the buildings. Mm. Mm. I think the problem with that is our own people, Afrikaners. It will very soon revert back to a system mm. where you want people to do your work for you, but you don't want... You, you, you still want to be in charge of your schools, your churches, your government institutions. Yeah. So how do you do that? Well, we want to decide how things are run in Urania. So you can't vote in our elections and that's not fair. Yeah. You can't have someone working here and not participating in the politics. It's just not fair. But now we want an Afrikaner space where we, we decide the politics, yeah. we decide the schools, we decide the churches. Uh, so then you back at Apartheid 2.0. So that's Thank the you. first thing. Second thing is... Um, um, it, it will be very easy to just start misusing people again. Yeah. To pay a person 100 rand a day to do all the bad things you don't want to do, scrub yeah. your toilets and do all the bad stuff. Very easy to go back to that. So it's the second thing. And then there's the third thing. Uh, we actively want to build our own community. We want to look back and say, you see that, those houses, that building, you see those streets, you see those uh, industries, yeah. we've built it. Yeah. We build it. This is our hands. We build it with these hands. We want to we wanna be proud of the work that we did. Yeah. Uh, it's not easy. It's a, it's a constant work of education, especially with newcomers, to understand how heavy this weighs for. It's weighs so heavy. You know, it's yeah. so, such an important part of what we are and what, who we are. 
And that's the third or the fourth thing. I can't remember now. And then the final thing is just to say, if it comes to job creation, let's solve the joblessness on community level. I don't believe the state should be solving that. I don't think the state are very good at solving joblessness. Yeah. I think entrepreneurs are good at solving joblessness. Yeah. They want people to work. Entrepreneurs around the country can make magic happen. Yeah. Entrepreneurs are the backbone of the economy. Yeah. They can make magic happen. Take away the restrictions on the economy. Take away this awful load shedding. Let people generate their own power, you know, on large scale. Give, cut the ties and let the people work. Let the people innovate. Let the yeah. people make plans. There's so many opportunities. We have live in a beautiful, beautiful country mm. with opportunities rich in, um, in resources. Mm. Uh, a bit poor in education, but education is, is, is not a long-term problem. It can be solved. People can be empowered. Yeah. But, but there must be a mind shift from what's the state going to do for me because the state is doing for itself. Sure. And it's doing, the, the state is doing mostly for the corrupt politicians that know how to use the state. The state, yeah. state's doing the most for them. Let's make a mind shift to the shift of communities. Yeah. And I think in South Africa on community level, there's two options. One is the bad option. It's warlords ruling over local areas. Doesn't matter. The police can't go, come in. The state can't come in. The military can't come in. It's gangsters ruling the streets. That's a very practical de facto reality on the ground mm. of people taking charge of an area. And there's a good type. Yeah. And that is communities built by the people for the good. Maintaining order, maintaining justice, keeping their own place clean, keeping, the, 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 keeping local laws and building that. Yeah. And I think the state is going to lose more and more power and warlords and communities will, 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 will be in a constant battle of the, the, the battle between chaos and order in South Africa sure. will be between those realities on the ground. I want to emphasize the one point you made about for people that are religious, for people that are rooted in their belief that a lot of people don't have money. Hmm. So you go to church uh, or you go to where, whatever your belief system may be and you're asked to offer money. And one of the things you're saying is one of the things we've forgotten is labor is a form of giving. Whether it's to the church, whether it's to God, if you want to say you believe in your ancestors, this is a way of giving because it's a way of creating something that didn't exist. The second thing is there's um, a black intellectual many years back in, in, in America who spoke about how the economy has changed over time with the Industrial Revolution and all those things. The family used to be the core of the economy. You yes. have a piece of land. Mm. The husband, the wife, the kids would work the land. And this is what kept families together. Mm. Later on, the economy changed and then the man was taken out. The women were left alone with the kids. Later on, the women were taken out. And it almost feels like Oranya's saying no to keep the family together, even from an economic perspective. Because people say, I leave home to go look for a job. You're like, you can create work mm. at home and you won't just create work, but you'll be able to bond with your family. Mm. Yes. Um, to a point where now... One of the arguments and one of the things I love about Oranya, even before coming here, the idea of saying relying on the state to solve problems when you are sitting unemployed, mm. but you can pick up rubbish, mm. you can use your hands, you can create something. Mm. Not only do you solve the problems which you're complaining about, but you acquire skills um, and you get in, to be involved in your, in your community and, and be dignified in it. Yes. This is something that you're willing to teach other communities. Um, yeah. It's one of the reasons I traveled here, by the way, mm. to come and see the example here so that colored Indian, black, mm. I can go and say, look, I've seen an example of this thing and it works. Mm. Is that something that people in Oranya, yourself as leadership, mm. are willing to go to other communities and say, we can teach you guys how we do it. Whether you want to use it or not, it's fine, but we do things ourselves. We don't yeah. wait for government yeah. or anyone else. In fact, uh, I think, especially for Afrikaners, it's fueled by... You know, we also don't like government very much. I mean, we didn't even like our own governments very much. We are free people. We like we like freedom, you know. Yeah. And when the government said certain things in, 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 the, in the old republics of the Transvaal and the Free State and later the NP government, we already already a bit, you know, like a bull kicking up dust for sure. certain things that the government said. We, we like, we are, we are free people. We Freight. like freedom. Freight, Freight is number one. It's number one. Yeah. And then when the when the when when the ANC government prescribes us certain things, we we get quite angry about those. So yeah. so that fuels us a bit in building our own thing and 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 making our own decisions. And that added to the fact that uh, Afrikaners don't like helplessness. You yeah. Know? Um, we 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 would like to you know you will see the symbol of Urania. We haven't been on the hill yet. Yeah. Symbol of Urania is a young boy, he's rolling up his sleeve. 
he's creating his own future. His, his fist is not in the air to fight or to attack. It's down, pointed down, but he's rolling up his sleeves to work. To That's work. the symbol of Urania. A poor make a plan. Poor make a plan. Yeah. And if we want to claim freedom and we want to claim these ideals, these noble ideals, you call it almost poetic, you know, it's, it's nothing if it's not um, subsidized by hard work, almost suffering sometimes, you know. Nothing that we've built here was easy. Yeah. We struggled, man, for yeah. 30 years. We lived like pioneers for a long time. Things went easy. Yeah. But we've built something that we are proud of. And now, yes, we, have, we are very willing to share it with other communities. We have been doing so. We have had relations with um, traditional leadership in many communities around black, the country. Black traditional leadership. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. The uh, um, Matabele people, Amabele people, the uh, uh, Barulong community yeah. close to Bloemfontein. Uh, we had a, a Khoisan community close to Springbok. Uh, and then the most famous example with which we have a formal memorandum of understanding is the community of Minyameni, a uh, Koza mm. community in the, in the Eastern Cape. We've been working with them, I think, for 14 years now, yeah. sharing ideas. The, the way our bank functions, for example, is an, an idea that we passed on to them and they created something similar. Yeah. Um, so those ideas, I mean, we, our resources, we have very little resources. Yeah. And that's what we have. In the first place, we don't want to share because we need it. And secondly, if you start sharing resources, it's, it's you, you, you developing dependency. Yes. It's not what we want to do. We want to develop independency. So we're not sharing our resources, the little that we have, sure. but we can share our ideas and our uh, ideals. And we, we love to do that, actually. It's, Thank you. Yeah. Um, how important do you think the story of, or uh, how important linked to the story of Oranya is uh, the great track? the four trackers mm. and Afrikaans people mm. constantly, because this almost fe feels like a, a great track yeah. 2.0 yeah. uh, in, in the moving of Afrikaans people to Oranje. Yeah, you have good insight to say that. I mean, there's a lot of Afrikaners who would not even see that in that fashion yet. Yeah. So you have good insight in our people to say that. But let me say this. My ancestors, you know, started over many times. Uh, my people, my family, family name, uh, people came here in 1689. 1689? Yeah, 1687 and uh, till 89, sure. the groups came. And, um, you know, a lot of Afrikaners, the French and the Flemish Huguenots, and um, some of the Dutch, so they came here because of religious persecution in Europe. They were Protestant and the Catholics were killing them and so on. Killing them? Killing them, so yes. So they left because of religious reasons. Yes, they Jeez. said you could integrate there. And become Catholic. Catholic, or you could be killed, or you could leave. As and, a Protestant. And the Protestant said, we're not this leaving. this is the same Christian umbrella. We're not, Interesting. We're sure. not leaving. We're not leaving. Yeah. Ach, we're, not, we're not changing to Catholics. We're yeah. standing with our principles. Um, they came here um, because the Dutch uh, were Protestant as well. And they restarted. They left their businesses, their homes, everything. Some of their families they left behind. They yeah. restarted. Then the British came. And they kind of conquered in Europe. So they got the Cape. They took the Cape. And they, um, and they started forcing Afrikaners, early Afrikaners, to become English. They didn't want to be that. They left. You know, they left. They, yeah. they, 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 there was a few rebellions. There was a small, like, scuffle little rebellion, but the Afrikaners said, we don't want to make war, we, we're leaving, we're going to yeah. stand with our principles. They left their farms, they left their businesses, they left their families, they uh, left the church there, the church actually kicked them out for that decision, and they moved in inland. First to Natal, uh, got some uh, cattle back for the Zulu king, and they gave them the Republic of Natalia in Natal. Yeah. The British came again, and the Afrikaners moved again. Jeez. And... Um, and then it was, uh, they had their own republics, which the world acknowledged, the Transvaal and the Free State, yeah. two, two Boer republics. And then the British came again, it was the Ang first Anglo-Boer War, the second Anglo-Boer War. We like to call it the Freedom Wars. It wasn't the Boer War, we didn't want war, we just wanted our freedom. Yeah. And then uh, we left our republics and the British unified South Africa. And we had to start again from nothing. Yeah. And then... No matter how you view it now, retrospectively, but the NP got the government in what, uh, uh, 1948. They've started, got in government, Verwoord made South Africa a republic with the referendum in 61, mm. come a republic of South Africa. We saw that as, as freedom. Obviously, we now know that we, we uh, a lot of things like labor and politics and a lot of things, but it became a republic. Sure. And 94, Afrikaners lost political power again. We understand how it feels to lose business, family, the church, politic, political power, 
palms. We understand how to feel and yeah. we understand how to restart again. We're restarting. We believe that we're restarting on good and ethical grounds, yeah. building something sustainable and honest here in Orania. And that's why Orania's growth doesn't have to be from one person to 100,000 in five years or anything yeah. like that. But we, we must be sustainable. Sure. We're building this. We started in 91 with a few with 20 families. We got in the early 2000s to about 300 people. It went up a bit. It went down a bit again. And then from 2012, we've been growing consistently. From 2016 to 2020, 12% average growth. 2020, 16% growth in a year. Jeez, people moving here. People moving here, children being born. Yeah. Town is growing. Growing in people, we're growing in infrastructure and we're building a place for our people. Yeah. It is okay to be on your own side. It's okay to be, if you're an Afrikaner, it's okay to be on Afrikaner's side. Yeah. If you're a Zulu, it's okay to be on the Zulu side. Yeah. You don't have to put yourself last. Sure. You also don't have to destroy and demolish other peoples. Yeah. You can help them, yeah. but it's also okay to be on your own side. And that's where Rania. We are on our own side here. Sure. You know, we have a very nuanced political standpoint here, but we are on our own side. And we and we say, this is how we do it. Other communities come learn. Yeah. We can show what we have. We can give what we have in terms of knowledge. And let's build a community of communities in this country. I want to speak about the British, but a quick question. Um, what's your population like currently? Orania's current population is, a, uh, is around 3,000 people. 3,000. Out of yes. how many potential Afrikaans people in South Africa? 2 million. 2 million. Mm. Only 3,000. Only 3,000. Because I think that's one of the misconceptions that yes. all Afrikaans people are here or have yeah. a base here. It's a very yeah. small group. And that we're all very rich and things like no, that. You know, Orania is not the best economic investment. It is, however, the best investment you can make for your children. Sure. Let me tell you that. You know, when Professor Karl Bosso, shortly before his death in 2012, he... An interviewer asked him. Shortly before? His death. Who? Professor Karl Bosov Sr. Karl's dad. Oh, his dad. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Jeez, I was like, no, yeah. man. What do you mean his dad? <laughs> I'm sure. Okay. Sorry. His so, father. So the interviewer asked him, what was your, what was your biggest disappointment about Durania? Hmm. He said that we're so small. So small? So small. We, we believed something great will happen. Yeah. And the next question, what's your biggest achievement? What, you, what you're most proud of about Turania? I said that we are as far as we are. And I was in 2012, there was 1,500 people maybe, that yeah. we are as far as we are. Because we knew if we are 100,000 people Im Im immediately after 91, we would have reverted back to old habits. Yeah. We would have reverted back to old uh, habits of, of cheap black labor, sure. misusing that. Sure. We need to go through this process, creating this place. Yeah. And uh, Iranians aren't counted. We are weight, you know. Our weight is what counts. Hey. So that is what counts. We can be a thousand, we can be three thousand, we can be ten thousand. It's fine. But you will find that Iranians are a special breed of people, highly motivated, and highly, highly um, enthusiastic about the future. Sure. I want to speak about uh, the British. Uh, the number three thousand is interesting because one of the conversations we had was about the Spartans. Yes. And you're speaking now about don't count us in numbers, count us in weight and impact. I mean, yeah. this town on its own is, is legendary, not just in South Africa, but in the world. 3,000 is linked to almost like 300, the mm. movie about the Spartans. Mm. Mm. So I think that's, that's quite symbolic uh. Uh, for you guys. Uh. Uh, and there's, I'll allow you to say this line again uh. before I speak about uh. the British. There's a great line you gave earlier mm. uh, about the Spartans yes. or the Spartan king. Yes. Yeah. You asked me why there's no wall around Turania. Because that's another myth. Uh. There's no high wall, high fence, border gate. Uh. Are they going to let you in? I'm yeah. like, bro, I don't know because there's no gates to get <laughs> into here. Yeah. So there's no wall. And then you ask me, why is there, or someone asked me, why is there no wall? And I said, the best thing I can think of is the Spartan king. When I think it was a Persian or another Greek or someone say, oh, are you this place, you speak about Sparta being so powerful, you don't even have a wall around your city. And he, in the, the king pointed his finger at his men, at his warriors, and he said, Sparta has a wall, there's our wall, Jeez. our men, you know, our men is our wall. Goosebumps! You know what Durania's wall is? Doing our own labor, doing our own work, being vigilant members of the community. This is our place, yeah. you know, we are the wall. Uh, doing our own work is the wall. And also, you know, Durania is a place with, with good intentions. We, um, we try to have good relations with, with other peoples and with government as far as possible. Um, and that's also a part of our a way to, to defend ourselves and, and uh, we don't want to be the um, 
the the we don't want to be in constant conflict yeah we want peace yeah we want peace it doesn't mean we we can be a dangerous people but that's not the goal we we want peace we want peace and prosperity for sure. this continent but um people who mean us harm will soon learn that doesn't matter how many we are this we are the wall and we will protect our place jeez there's a golden thread in your story constantly the british constantly the british are involved constantly the british Anglo Boer War. Orania exists. It's meant to thrive. And in my head, I'm almost thinking until a new group of British people come through. Mm. How how does how do people in Orania feel about the English, the British? How do Afrikaans people in general feel? Mm. How do you feel right now? You and I are sitting here. I I'm a Zulu boy from KwaZulu Natal in Newcastle. Mm. You're an Afrikaner boy, mm. even though you're from Peter Maritzburg mm. originally, but you're here now. Mm. We're here speaking that same language mm. of English. We're mm. almost being forced mm. to meet halfway in like yeah. on British terrain. Yeah. yeah. You know, my grandparents could speak fluent Zulu. And uh my my mother is still a bit I have not had the privilege to 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 learn it as a child. I was too young when moving here. What time did you at what age did you leave? No, uh, at three or four years old. Three, to, four years yeah, old. And you've yeah, been here sure. since. Yeah, I've been here since. I I've left and went to study and things like that. Sure. But, been here a majority of my life so I haven't had the a privilege of, 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 of learning that but you know um, English is now the global language yeah. and the problem with the British Empire destroying the freedom of the Afrikaner republics also destroying the freedom of the uh, Zulu kingdom uh, in the same globalist centralist rhetoric that the ANC is doing the same thing in, 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 in my eyes now so um, not granting peoples their freedoms so the problem of the British is not that they're British. The problem was the fact that they were imperialists, mm. colonialists. And we spoke about this earlier. I, I view myself as a part of Africa. Yeah. Most people of Orania see themselves as people of Africa. Yeah. So we're not yet to make a lot of money and go back to some, some country. There are su such people in South Africa. You can be sure of that. Yeah. It's not our goal. We are people of the land as well. We want to see this, 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 this geographical space prosper and we want to see Afrikaners prosper and everyone else yeah. who doesn't mean us harm. We want to see them prosper. So we're not yet to take resources and leave. Sure. We are yet to build something. So the problem with the, with the British is not the fact that they are British. It was the fact that they are a colonialist force yeah. taking people's resources and, and leaving them. Um, it's a nuanced conversation. You can, you can, we can speak a long time about colonialism and things like that. Uh, but the short answer is that globalist ideals it's not something that resonates with us we are freedom loving people you know we always have kind of if you look at the the roman empire with the barbarians which is my ancestors you, know, <laughs> you have the men of the empire and you have the men who are the barbarians and yeah. i think you know in afrikaans we speak about takara yeah you know it was the the boers in the anglo Boer war which had wild hair and wild eyes they call them the takara sure. you know the the, the the hair are like branches from a tree and uh, we are freedom loving people that's yeah. what we want we want to do our own thing so we don't like people telling us and that's an intelligent answer so you're almost saying i don't have an issue issue with the english language i don't have an in issue with english people mm. i have an issue with an ideology that wants to enforce onto me mm. don't do that and mm. i have an issue that wants to come and colonize and force mm. me to do things that i don't want i don't yes. like that yes i don't like that and i like the idea of mother tongue education for zulus for causas for vendas for yeah. afrikaners yeah. and for the english you know people have the right to their own mother tongue education now as I said, rights doesn't mean anything if you can't guarantee it. If you want mother tongue education, you need to guarantee it yourself. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do here as well. Um, but I don't like um, that idea of that centralization. We spoke yeah. about Jan Smits earlier. Yeah. That's why a lot of Afrikaners don't like him. He's a very polarizing figure, figure in the Afrikaner community. Young, General Jan Smuts, who yeah. I think is a very great South African. Yeah. All of us should learn about him and learn however you want to learn from yeah. his story. But I was very fascinated to learn that not all Afrikaans people like him. Yes. You were speaking yes. about his globalist yeah. views. Yeah. Yeah, because he was loved yeah. by Winston Churchill. Yes, yes, yes. And he cr created a lot of great things in the world, yeah. you know, in, in terms of the power that it took to build those things. You know, yeah. the UN flew out of, uh, is, is, a, is, is a direct um, effort from the thing he built, which was the Volker Bond. But um, it doesn't matter. You know, we, we like to build things from the ground up. Yeah. Uh, as as the people of Urania, and we would like to create a reality that is a local reality built from the from the yeah. ground up. And 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 uh, you, I don't know if you read the book Small is Beautiful, but small, small thing. Small is beautiful. Small is beautiful. There's something to say for building small things that's sustainable, um, rather than big international things. And uh, 
Book, and we, sorry. We, we spoke about, you know, labor and commercial systems and capitalism and all kind of things, yeah. you know, earlier. But I think in the end is you must put different weight to different things. Um, you mustn't be unsuccessful in your economic ventures. But GDP is not the ultimate measure of success. Uh, good sustainable lives may be better. You know, good families may be a good, good thing as well. Now, I think there's a problem of poverty in South Africa. It needs to be solved. And the best way to solve that is through the free market. Let entrepreneurs do their things. Um, cut them loose from government regulations. Let them build. Let them create. Let them innovate. Yeah. Um, and there's, a, there's so many opportunities in South Africa, man. We live yeah. in such a great, great space. Yeah. And I, I would rather, I won't live anywhere else. Sure. I don't see anywhere else as my home. I'm very, very happy living in South Africa in terms of the ge geographical space. Yeah. There's some political issues we need to sort out. <laughs> but, um, but in terms of the space, I don't think we should be very lucky to be able to live on this continent in this space, I think. I want to emphasize the book uh, EF, EF Sch Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, mm. I think is the name of the book. Yes. I want to emphasize again this thing you're saying because I think it's important in particular for the black communities in South Africa. And it's one of the things I admire about the apartheid government. You know, I think some of us are starting to look back at the apartheid government with less anger to try and see are there any learnings we can take from them. Some of the failures of the ANC government and look, the ANC government had a huge task. 80% of the population Today we're speaking maybe 48, 50 million black people that they kind of have to try and help. Mm. But the Afrikaner NP, National Party, when it came in, they focused on Afrikaans people. Mm. They made sure that they built good schools. Mm. Some of the best schools in the country are Afrikaans mm. schools. Some of the best tertiary institutions mm. as well. And we've got the NC government now and they failed to do the same for black people. Mm. They didn't go and build Zulu yes. schools, yes. Shitsonga yes. schools, uh, Swati, Kosa schools, etc. And to what you're saying and what I think Orania represents is, look, don't wait for the government. Mm. In Orania, we don't have the government mm. anymore, but we are building the schools that we want. Mm. And for black people, if you want to build mother tongue schools, mm. build them. Build them. Don't build wait them. for government. Build them. There's nothing, you know, that's the thing of uh, exponential growth, you know, and of composite interest. Composite yeah. interest is the, I think it's Einstein who said it's the most powerful force in the world. And you want, if you want to make an investment, make it sooner rather than later sure. and get that composite interest. And that Com compound. A compound, 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 interest, compound yeah. interest. And that investment is also a community. Yeah. If we didn't start Urania in 91 and said, oh, what? it's Let's not wait. perfect. It's not yeah. perfect yet. Let's do it in 95. Ah, the, the politics aren't right now. Oh, it's not the right piece of land. Oh, we don't have the right system. Yeah. Hell, we have complicated systems here because of uh old things that we started in a certain way yeah. but we started sure. we started now we have schools the one school population of 3,000 people we got 500 kids in the one school you that's know brilliant. Th that school is going out competing in america in in a in a in a international world seven school rugby tournament that's brilliant. getting getting you know winning uh in 2018 getting second in 2019 we have uh, uh education system that we export from here in terms of um of distance learning. You know, we have kids coming here for for after school education in terms of um, technical trades, yeah. learning. We're rebuilding Afrikaners' technical skills. We've lost it because we, all of us wanted to be managers and corner officers. Of yeah. Now we're rebuilding those skills, plumbers, electricians, those things. We're training those people because we know we're building a city here, mm -hmm. but we also train them in terms of, we know it's Afrikaans kids. We're training them and giving them the the tools to, yeah. to navigate the world. Whether they stay here or not doesn't matter. Yeah. We are giving them something that will last. No one can take away those skills. Sure. You can't take away people's skills. So that's why we, we're doing that. Um, I mean, building out our energy network because we must look after our people. We know we must look after our um, economy. Uh, so we started building the solar farm. It started yeah. small. Started with a bit of investment money that we had to pay back. Started generating our own power. Now it's more than one megawatt being generated. It's going to expand. And we're building, now we're having a battery built that will carry our entire community through load shedding. Um, completely. Completely. Entire community. The community and all the water pumps for the agriculture. Big, big pumps pumping water. Yes. We, 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 we're taking a... a I, wanna, I don't want to call it a financial risk. Yeah. <laughs> Let's rather say a financial. We 
grabbing onto a financial opportunity of sure. buying a 4.8 megawatt battery, which is going to support our community so that there's no load, load shedding from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Let the economy work. If, 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 if you have that mindset of saying, we can't fail. We have, we, failure is not an option. Yeah. Our economy must continue. Our people will go into poverty if the economy isn't working. Entrepreneurs must work. The service delivery sector must work. Tourism sector and construction se sector must continue. We need to buy that battery. We're going to do it. And we'll make a plan with it. We put down our initial payments and we will, we will continue. Uh, we crowdfunding it out of the community through a levy. Sure. Um, so there's a small battery levy and uh, it must work. It will work. Um, G GDP is not the only way to measure success. And I think that's such an important line that there's, there's other measures, successful families, happy mm. families, etc. You guys are in the middle of nowhere. And I always hear people complaining about Orania. And I've heard a few people visit here be like, this place is in the middle of nowhere. And it's mind blowing how far this place is from Kimberley, from Bloemfontein as examples. Why did you guys choose to be here? Because I think it's mind blowing for anyone who's never been here. Ah, Afrikaans people are, it's like, please go there, go see where it is. Mm. It's literally, you spoke about desert if you drive out, etc. Mm. Why did you guys choose here? Mm outside of the land being available. You could have built near Pretoria, mm. near, you could have driven one hour just out of, mm. you know, Gauteng, one hour just out of, and, and built there a bit more convenient. Mm. In, in one word, we chose this place because we were serious about what we're building. Jeez. We were serious about what we're building, and it was chosen with a vision in mind that the people who started, they are already dead. They just trusted it will realize. And that is the idea that, Afrikaners need a piece of land which is not very wanted by anyone else. So, I mean, this is semi-desert, it's arid. Yeah. If you drive 10 kilometers, five kilometers from the river, there's nothing but bush, harsh, yeah. dry, cold winters, hot summers. Yeah. We chose it semi-desert circumstances. We chose it very specifically because yeah. we knew no one else really wants it. It's the highest province in the country with the lowest population. Afrikaners can become a majority here. Okay. There's not a lot of people here, so we can it's become... A, it's the biggest province in terms of land size, but very yeah. small population. Very yeah. small population. And especially this part where we are now. Yeah. It's, it's, there's almost no one. Sure. So we can become a majority here, and we can do our own labor and stay a majority here. And what's more is um, it isn't the vineyards of the Cape. Yeah. It isn't the diamond fields. It isn't the gold mines yeah. of the north of the country it is not the great agricultural lands for 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 in the north sure. or the great great views of the natal yeah it's a tough place to live yeah you got to be pretty serious about this idea if you want to come here correct um so that's exactly why we chose it it was specifically specifically chosen for those yeah. reasons and the people moved here my uh, one good friend always has a saying you know there's something else about the desert afrikaner a desert Afrikaner is a different <laughs> breed of human. You'll find them in the Kalahari, you'll find them here in the Karua. Yeah. It's people who, who think and act different. And um, yeah, that's why we're here. Our cities have been built around uh, commodities, mostly mining, gold, mm. diamonds, mm. Uh, where possible, maybe agriculture. Yes. You guys didn't build a city around an economy. You built a city and then created an economy. Yes. Um, you came here with nothing. You know, people moved to Johannesburg. At some point, there was the Kimberley Diamond Rush. I mean, there's the coast, beautiful oceans. There's none of that here. Yeah. What do you have to say around coming here with no economy, building yeah. an economy, and maybe just some of the highlights of some of the mm. businesses and industries here? People lost a lot moving here in the early days. Yeah. You know, it was all successful people because people struggling, they wouldn't even think about moving somewhere for an idea. Yeah. Mostly successful people, a lot of intellectuals, they moved here for the idea. And most of them went from middle class to kind of poor, yeah. to, to struggling, because there was nothing here. Sure. So we started the economy around, we, we created the town around an idea, and we created the economy around the town. Yeah. Now the economy is growing. Interesting fact, our growth in new businesses yearly is, I think, 25%. 25%? 25% growth in new businesses every year. We are entrepreneurs. So that's that's kicking off quite well. Sure. We'll see in the newest census, the 2023 census, which will be published soon, we'll see what, what that is. Um, and then we stimulated our economy with two um, economic development plans. The first one from 2016 to 2020, um, and the second one from 2020 
uh, oh, from 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 from, tw from the last year, 2023 onwards, sure. 20, 28. And the idea is how can we build our economy? The URA, our own currency, yeah. is one of those ideas. So what we did is, it's obviously not a currency because only the South African government can make a currency inside the borders of South Africa. Sure. What you can do, you can create a coupon system which is tied one-to-one -one with the rand and you can conduct your business. This is something that anyone can do in the country. Anyone can do it. Create a coupon, could look like a currency, behave yes. like a currency, and it works within a certain space. Exactly. So why, okay. why do we do it then? First, to get monetary value to circulate in our local economy, yeah. right? So it circulates in the economy, meaning it doesn't leave the economy. Yeah. So in the poorest places in South Africa, 10 rand doesn't, uh, it circulates once and then it goes out. out yeah. In the richest places in South Africa, 10 rand never leaves. Yeah. It circulates, right? So that's the same thing. We wanted money to circulate internally. That helped a lot. Sure. Second thing is safety and security because I'm not going to put a gun to your head for money that I cannot use elsewhere. Yeah. And furthermore, they can come and steal all your coupons. They can't buy anywhere else. Can't do anything. So why yeah. will you do it? So no one knows the amount of URAs. You, you can still use RAND in Urania. Yeah. No one knows what the, uh, uh, is it rand or ura now at the gas station or at the supermarket? Sure. What's the, you know, what's the amount? Sure. So it's never really worth it to rob it sure. because you don't know what you're going to get. Sure. Uh, thirdly, um, the ura is backed by the rand, meaning the back is in, the, the, the rand is in the bank, mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 to give it that backup. Sure. So what does, what happens with money in a bank? Gains interest. Yeah. So that money, that, 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 that investment is growing sure. while we trade with coupon, little papers. Sure. And the last thing is symbolism. We try to position ourselves as unique as possible, as often as possible, mm -hmm. because a uniquely identifiable people has the right to, to rule over themselves and make their own decisions. Yeah. And what we're doing here is with, with our own symbols on our currency that we use, we communicate something about ourselves as well. Yeah. Say, this is who we are. Uh, I'll show you some words back then. They tell a story sure. of family, of institutions, of development, of faith, and all those things. Sure. It's quite important to us. Um, farming is something that you guys are, are big on. Yes. Um, as, a, as a community, as a vision of a mini country, uh, what are some of the biggest things you guys export mm -hmm. out of Orania, either into South Africa or elsewhere, yeah. that bring money in? So the this, this successful agricultural ventures that export. We also have local ventures that's more for consumption. Okay. Like lamb and, and mutton, as lamb we said earlier. Lamb and mutton was a big joke. <laughs> we'll discuss it on another day. And, um, and, you know, gardens with vegetable and fruit and so on. Yeah. But the things that we export, we do on, on scale, and that is wheat and maize, which we plant on the same fields okay. uh, in the same years. Okay. So one season, one season. So it's intense, intense farming. Okay. The other one is pecanuts, which is quite successful. Uh, there's a big market for that in the east, especially China. Sure. Pecanuts, we have good weather for that. We started orchards long ago, and what we do now, we automate the harvesting process. Sure. So minimal labor, maximum technology. Sure. Uh, it's also something that we had to build up over time because in the beginning, we didn't have the money for the uh, machines. Yeah. So people harvested by hand, which was really labor expensive. Yeah. But... Um, but now more and more we can we can do that with the machines and that helps a lot. Sure. So that's some of the big exports. Then we also export our knowledge. Yeah. So you have people who are qualified as a lawyer, as an accountant, as an IT specialist, and they through the internet, yeah. ex, ex, they, they share their knowledge. We're also installing now fiber optic cable to every new development, fiber, fiber optic connection for internet yeah. to um, all new service plots. So yeah. the ISP and the internet service providers can come later, but at least we have the option of giving people fast internet sure. so they can export knowledge and grow the economy. That's an important step yeah. in visualizing where we want to be in 10 years and 20 years saying, well, the internet's going to play a major role. We need to get on that boat and, yeah. and make sure we, we supply our people with that. It's a good investment for future uh, business. No, thank you. I, I realize in the interest of time, we won't cover everything. I've got so many things I want to raise and so many things I want to chat about. I'm going to try and just finish off the last few points with some of the things that stood out for me. Um, the first bookmark I want to make, this is just for, for archiving so that when we sit down again, we speak about it. But the idea of um, adding cryptocurrencies under the aura, mm. you know, as a way to have your own currency actually, mm. yes. especially one that works internationally somehow yes. and is not limited by the rent. Mm. Um, at some point, I hope we can cover some of the spaces that you took us to, especially mm. the safety center you guys have mm. created um some of the developments 
Mm. Some of my fascination were, was the different type of materials you use for your residential homes. Mm. Mm. Some of the stories around female-only construction mm. companies. Have you ever seen a house that has been built fully by just women? Mm. Very fascinating. Afrikaner women. Afrikaner mm. women. Um, great story about an Afrikaner artist who's had an impact yeah. on the town as well. Yes. A woman as well. Yes. Um, there's a story that really touched me and I, I found my, my eyes watering um, mm. when you were telling it. I read an amazing book that inspired me called And Then They Fired Me by, I think he's a billionaire today. He's called the Pura Buffett, uh, Yanni Muton of PSG. They've invested in Curo, uh, Pioneer Foods, Stadio Today, Capitec, mm. etc. Very, very lucrative investment company. He tells in, in his book the story of when he was a kid and how a lot of people assume today that Afrikaners and their amazing schools just started off great with money and they didn't have all those things and they used to start off their rugby fields were not level. He, mm. he cracks the jokes of the one yell after wouldn't see the other yell mm. after the when fullbacks because it was, it was like a, a heel that they yeah. were playing on. And they didn't have school buses. So parents would load boys on the back of buckies mm. to go and play at nearby towns. And then over time, they raised the money through community for the buses. They leveled the fields. Mm. I mean, I was looking at one of the, at your school here and the, the rugby fields, you said 10,000 cubic, mm. cubic square meters of, of soil. Yeah. To, to, to lay that down. Yes. yes. Um, when we got to your municipality, and I'm going to allow you to tell the story, but I'm going to start it off. Oranya has its own municipality, which is very unique because mm -hmm. this doesn't just happen. But it's because you guys had started, I think, nine years prior in being like, look, we have a Baki, we will do our own service mm -hmm. delivery. Mm -hmm. People are not coming here to pick up our rubbish. People are not coming to sort out our things. The same thing could be said about how you guys started off with your own medical center. Like, we will do for ourselves. Mm. And somewhere in time, things will develop. Mm. I'm going to allow you to take over from there in how you guys set up your own municipality. Mm. Uh, I don't know which elections it was, but please go for it. A journalist once asked me, you know, you guys, you, you speak, speak of the spy in the sky kind of ideals that you have. Sure. You really believe this. You really believe it's going to work out. Sure. I said, I do believe it's going to work out. Not because of where we are, but because I know where we came from. And we had the guts to start. And one of the things that we started with is to s start in 1991 when Urania started to say, we are our own municipality and we will deliver our services to our people ourselves, no matter what. And it started with, uh, I mean, yeah, guys with brooms trying to clean the streets and trying to fix the drains and the town was in bad shape and so on. Okay. And one of the things were a very, very old bucky, you know, broken and ugly and bumped. Actually, it was not very long ago, a lot of the fleet of the municipality was still old buckies, not in great shape. Yeah. And they had this bucky, and I always think about this as such a good example of trusting yourself and starting with this in faith. And... Um, we did the rubbish removal. They did the rubbish removal with that bucky. Mm. And that bucky almost became a symbol because in 2000, when the ANC changed the way that municipalities work, they yeah. changed. So you had municipalities all around the country, but suddenly every centimeter of the land were allocated to a municipality. Sure. And when that happened um, in, in 2000, it got official. Urania said, well, since 91, we were delivering our own services. No one is going to come now suddenly and tell us they are taking over. Sure. Well, we had so little space, but we said, this is ours. No one is taking it. No one is delivering our services. We will deliver it ourselves. Yeah. And that Bucky, I almost want to say, became a symbol of that. To say that reality was created in 91, but the reality is continuing in 2000, and 2000 when the election started. Yeah. And there were some legal uh, things that the state didn't do correctly in, in, in making Orania part of Timbilichli municipality, which is Hopetown and Stradenburg. Yeah. And um, they said, you don't have a choice. You have to become part of that municipality. We said, well, you know, we are Afrikaners. We always have a choice. We will make a choice. <laughs> if we, you know, so, um, and we just said, uh, we, we, we will deliver our own services. Thank you very much. And we will continue with that. That became a court case. Yeah. And um, that continued in the high court in Kimberley. Uh, every time it was postponed, it was postponed because the state didn't bring the, the I can't remember the exact details, but there was some evidence or something that they had to prove and they couldn't prove it, or whatever. Postponed, postponed until two days or three days before the elections of the year 2000, municipal yeah. elections. And the court just said, listen, 
the state failed to prove any reason why Orania should become part of Timbalit. Sure. And they don't have the evidence now. So if there's a dispute ab- over one municipality in the country, the entire country's elections must be postponed. You can't have elections and just not do one municipality. Yeah. You know, you have to do all of them. And the state said, well, we're not, we can't do that. Yeah. It's two, three days before the election. Are the Oranians willing to settle outside of court with the state? And we settled. And that settlement was made an order of the court. It was revisited later and so on and so on. But in the end, because of the fact that we started, yeah. the guts to start, and I'm not bragging or anything. It's, uh, for me, it's, it's just all um, grace. But the guts to start and to create something, even if it's just an old bucky driving rubbish around, yeah. we started. And that fact that we had started nine years prior gave us the legal grounds to continue. Yeah. And um, so now Rania has got a unique municipality, no party politics. We don't, have, we don't like it very much, but no party politics. And we then went and said, okay, as a sign of good faith, an act of good faith, we also not vote in Timbilithe's municipal elections. Yeah. Because we can't say you have no control over us, we will do our own services, we'll be have our own place, but we want to influence your elections. Sure. We're not doing that. We won't vote there. Act of good faith, it's no way, it's no way formally a contract. We just yeah. say, as an act of good faith, we do that. And we vote for individuals, not political parties. Independent. Independent. Yeah. If I trust you, I nominate you and someone seconds that and you become a candidate. Yeah. And if people vote for you, they keep you responsible because Orania is not a big place. You, you find that man in the supermarket, you find him maybe <laughs> when you're having a beer, you say, listen, you promised this and this and this. Now you're doing sure. that and that and that. Pull your stuff together. And that can sometimes be harsh for a leader in Orania. You know, sure. you, yeah, the, people, the people aren't easy. Afrikaans aren't easy people. They yeah. are they're tough people. They, they ex- but it's, it's good because they won't ask, they won't expect anything that they won't deliver on themselves as well. You yeah. know, they're very self-sufficient people. And you will see that we incentivize that. Not only are we working towards the battery, towards the uh, energy independence for the community, we also make it easy for homeowners and business owners to become energy independent on their own. Okay. How do we do that? We give the best rights for putting energy back in the grid that you don't use yourself. Okay. And I want to tell you more about that sometime. I'll show you maybe tomorrow. Uh, the energy master plan that we're working on. We want to. We are the uh, municipality in the country pays the best. So I think we pay one hundred fifty or one hundred sixty per unit that you give back to sure. the to the municipality. Now the second base is Cape Town. I'm under correction, but I think they do ninety cents per unit that you give back. Cheers. Okay. So we do a, a very very good rights for people putting um, energy back into the grid by putting solar panels on their roofs. Sure. We make it easy for them to become part of the system so that they as a house, they as a, as a family, they as a business, it's not only independent with solar power, but they also put something in for the community as well. Yeah. So we want to incentivize independence on the lowest possible level, the family for us. Yeah. I want to I wanna thank Aaron's van Sale of AfriForum. Um, I got goosebumps when I sat with him on the panel show when he spoke about self tune. Yeah. You know, self sustenance, something that I think the Black Panthers in America were big on, something that Stephen Bantu Biko, Black Consciousness, was big on. Um, it's nice to see Afri Forum sign uh, of, for your Gemeenschapsveiligheidsgebouw. Gemeenschapsveiligheidsgebouw. You got it. To see that they, yeah. they contributed to that yeah. as well it was very yeah. beautiful. I want to thank um, Tiens Vessels, yes. who was in charge there. I want to thank uh, Peter Bischoff, who showed us some of the plans for your developments. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to sp- thank the lady of the restaurant we were at, Magdalena. Mm. I want to thank, thank Stefan, our, our waiter as well. Um, it's, it's been very touching being here. Mm. And I've learned so much from, from you, from the history of this town. I'm sure I'm going to be learning a lot from Dr. Karol mm. also as well. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to, to close yes. off with. Yes, I do. Down. I do. Yeah. I want to ask the question I ask everyone. We get interesting people here. I have received the Embassy of Indonesia, yeah. which was interesting. Russian people from the from their consulate. I've had traditional communities, princesses from traditional royal families. I've had American government officials, you know, and I have had very interesting South Africans, of which you are one. I want to ask you, Daniel, how did your how did some of the preemptive ideas in your mind differ from what you've seen here today it's very only a short while yeah yeah but um, and you don't have to be all positive if there's negative things sure. as well you've showed that but how was the preset ideas in your mind and what you saw here today how is that different 
So I'm planning to make a standalone video by myself on my thoughts and my experiences here. I've liked Oranje for a really long time. Since before I came here, I read the articles, I watched some of the videos. The idea of doing for yourself independence, the idea of freedom, something I'm, it's the reason I couldn't really stay in corporate. Mm. I used to be in banking. I love owning my time. Mm. I love hard work. That's something I get from my mother as well. She used to make us work in the garden. We used to clean up after ourselves. We've never had a helper. We never had a nanny. We never had a gardener. It's just from my mom's side, it's like it's because we didn't have money. But that taught you certain principles. So even before I came here, I was a huge fan. And it's one of the things that a lot of black people have attacked me for on social media. I used to be a paying member of Afri Forum. I still support and donate where I can to some of the initiatives. I love people that put in good work. Mm. I love people who've got a clear vision, who've got great leadership. And today I thought I was coming to just a cleaner township of white Afrikaans people. Mm. I didn't know I was coming to a, a fully functional town that is organized, that is complicated. I mean, one of the mm. things we have to talk about on another day is mm. the different portions and structures mm. of land mm. ownership. It's not owned by one person. It's mm. not just like mm. Stain City, mm. a waterfall city mm. in one estate. The, diff the complexities of that, mm. the back and forth of democracy and intelligent democracy where as much as the people you have a voice, it's people that actually work for themselves. Mm. It's people that are not entitled. Mm. It's people that when they do decide on something, they know exactly what they're deciding on and they know they also have a responsibility. The beauty of what used to be a desert reminds me of Dubai. Mm. Uh, I visited Dubai for the first time last year and there's still desert when you drive a little bit out. Um, outside of Dubai, I was thinking of another place, Sun City, Sol Kersner, who also went to build stunning tourist resort in the middle of nowhere, mm. like Las Vegas. I've never been there in Nevada, which was built on a desert. You guys saw a vision. I'm, I think there's biblical stories that mm. seeing like a promised land that doesn't even exist. Mm. When someone's like, when are we getting to the promised land? You're like, you, you don't go to it, you build it. Mm. And you guys are doing it and we're seeing it. And I wish so many South Africans, Africans and other people could come here. Understanding that Afrikaners are not the same. There are white Afrikaners that do not like this place, mm. that do not like you guys, that don't like what you stand for. It's humbling and it's nuanced and it, 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 it reminds me of why such conversations are important. Mm. But more than anything, my mind has been blown. Seeing the kids, seeing people that are passionate mm. about their people. Mm. One of the things I struggle with today is figuring out who are my people. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Is it black people? Is it South Africans? Is mm. it, mm. Uh, I mean, you're a Christian. Mm. If I was Christian, would it be Christians? It mm. was, right now, I'm just like, I just like good, hardworking people. Mm. Mm. They may have their own people somewhere else, but mm. it's, it's that. I, I've had so many myths broken. There's a beautiful mm. story of um, 15, 16 year old boys mm. that were building the pipes that were the mm. first almost irrigation water systems mm. here. You can't help mm. but get goosebumps mm. thinking of the potential of what this town could be. Mm. And I think of how Oranya as a, as, a, as a town, as a mythical center, is, it's got so many stories, but there isn't like a, a true story that is still coming out. Mm. I think ex-president Jacob Zuma has been here. Mm. I think ex-president Nelson Mandela may have been here. Mm. Other leaders, I think we spoke of Julius Malema being mm. here. They're not telling a true story of being here. And it's like, you can't tell it until you come here. Mm. Mm. And, and I can't show you. I've seen some of the videos. You have to come and see it. Mm. I, I don't have words, mm. but I'm, I'm, I'm truly inspired. Yeah, just and wonderful. your graciousness and your hospitality. I mean, I was meant to visit sometime last year. Mm. And even when I'd forget, you'd be like, you must come visit. Mm. And I'm like, thank you. Mm. You know, I had questions for you. And I mean, we don't really have to cover them, but I guess for completeness, mm. the two questions that people always ask about, mm. um, are people from Oranya racist? Mm. Is it a white only town? And are black people welcome? Mm. Is people of Oranya racist? I can assure you that there are some racist people in Oranya. Yeah, yeah. Are Oranians as a whole racist? Not at all. Is the Oranya idea racist? It's not a racist idea. You will find racist people in every corner of the world. There is no doubt about that. That's definitely the case. But Urania is an idea. The moment it becomes an idea that's built on racism, it will fail. Yeah. It is not an idea built on hate. It is an idea built out of problem solving, 
and love for our culture and, yeah. and so on. Um, Urania outperformed many other similar projects because of the fact that we not, are not trying to isolate ourselves. Yeah. We're not trying to, is isolation is death. We will die if we isolate. Now, we can also die by integration, right? Afrikaners can also just become a part of this gray, undefined South Africanism yeah. and just be part of that. That's not what Urania stands for. We can't isolate ourselves, but we must maintain ourselves. Yeah. So maintaining without isolation, and that is Urania. So we are proud of who we are. Yeah. We position ourselves as unique as possible, as often as possible. We're not even mainstream Afrikaners. We are a subgroup, I would say. We are very specific Afrikaners that is willing to live here, Afrikaners that embrace own labor, mm -hmm. that is Christian, and so on. So there's a lot of add-ons to that. Yeah. Um, but we can't isolate ourselves from the world. Yeah. And, um, and for that reason... Um, uh, Urania is what it is. And and secondly, whites only, Urania is not the whites only community, Afrikaner only community, you know. A white atheist from England is just not going to get right to residency in Urania. Um, because it's not about the narrative that was a popular narrative in South Africa in the 70s and 80s in the apartheid years, which was you get black people and you get white yeah. people. No, man. We are a cultural community. Yeah. We are Afrikaner community. There's people around the world, Europeans, Americans, and so on, trying to come and live here, yeah. realizing that, well, I'm not an Afrikaner. Um, so how can I truly align myself with a town's principle that is main goal is Afrikaner freedom. Yeah. If I'm not even able to speak Afrikaans, sure. if I don't know their tradition, the religion, it's easy to say, oh, well, I am Christian. Do you know what it was for the f first five, six hundred years? Uh, Protestant prosecution, you know, the history of the Great Trek, all that things, a shared history is such a powerful thing. Yeah. The history of the Trek, the history of the wars, the history of the things that we fought, you know. And so many interesting things, you know, when Zulus and Afrikaners were, worked together to fight the British after the um, after the Great Trek and all those things. Yeah. It's such a nuanced and big history. So white won't qualify you to get into Irania. Sure. It's a cultural community. And the last thing is, um, you know, the people that can come live here. I think I can answer that question. I, th I think I'll do something different, but I can answer that question. Sure. I can say firstly, yes, well, anyone can apply for citizenship, right to residency in Iran. Now, anyone can apply. Yeah. It's a it's a good intentions, good faith, bona fide process, and you can do it. Yeah. But a very important question must be asked. Do you align with our goals and our visions, and do you really want to live here? Yeah. Um, and secondly, you know, a lot of people who want to demand right to live in Urania now, especially people who don't share our faith, mm. don't share our ideals, typically people with victim mentalities. Who It was nice for them in a certain stage not being Iranians when it was tough. And now things are looking better. And yeah. now suddenly, you know, why can't you, why won't you let yeah. me? Uh, that is, that is uh, uh, including white people, including Afrikaners and so on. People that maybe don't share our faith or our, our, our values and so yeah. on. And I always ask, where were those people in 91 when we started with a vision? Sure. Did they want to come and live here then? At the, did they have that dream yet then? Or did the, the, they want the advantages of Urania yeah. now? So I think anyone can apply. Sure. But one must be realistic in understanding that Urania is an Afrikaner community. Sure. That is the entire goal that exists to preserve Afrikaner culture, to preserve sure. our Christian faith and to build a new system. Sure. And if I'm completely honest, you know, that is the kind of people that lives here yeah. and will continue to live here. And um, and that not interfering with 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 the legality of the option of applying for citizenship, that is always a thing that is weighed individually by the people of Urania. The people that decide that are people from the street. You yeah. know, the average man on the street makes a committee of three people sure. with one with one uh, official, and they make those decisions. So it's a decision of the people. The community has to be comfortable to let you in. Yes, which is something that we we, we think. Ah, if they're racist, they won't let us in. It's like, but if you lived in a community of like-minded people, mm. would you be comfortable letting just anyone in? And the thing is, the communities, the prosperity of the community is always weighing heavier than the, than the newcomer. Yeah. Uh, we have a pro-growth policy. We sure. want Afrikaners to come. Sure. But we also have a policy where we state the community, their, their safety, their security, their uh, values yeah. and their welfare weights it's it, uh, it weights more than than anything else except sure. the word of god but that weights the most for us yeah. so um 
So that's why, you know, we've, we've, we bled and we sweat to, to build what we have. Yeah. And we've surely not just going to say, okay, well, now we're going to switch to an open borders policy. It's so called. Yeah. So, so I think that's just to, to sum that up, uh, Peniel, I think. Um, Orania is the freedom of association of the newcomer associating with us yeah. and the freedom of association of the community associating with the newcomer. Yeah. It works both ways. I need to mention these places because they've been compared with Orania and you've said that they're not the same. I think Eureka is one of them, Kleinfontein, uh, Philadelphia Arc or Philadelphia Sa Arc. I'm going to look it up as some of these projects where people are like racist, white people live there and they don't want black people there. There's a very funny clip, um, BBC... I don't know if he was a journalist. His name was Louis Thoreau. Yeah. He's got a couple of documentary visiting radical pro-black people in America. Mm. Mm. There's one where he visits South Africa back in the day with Eugene Ter Blanche of mm. the Avia Beer back then. And Eugene Ter Blanche goes through this list of what it takes mm. to be a, a mm. boer. Mm. 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 <laughs> and Louis Thoreau asks, what if I have all these qualities, mm. Mm. but I'm just not white and mm. I'm black? Can I be a boer? Mm. I thought that was very funny because yeah. Eugene Blanche at the end is like, I'll send you a white light. Yeah. <laughs> and Louis is like, what do you mean? He's like, well, if I send you a black light, it won't be a light. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Eugene was also yeah. a very polarizing character. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I've, I've actually watched that interview and you know, um, that's one thing. There was a lot of people talking about all kinds of things and reclaiming the Afrikaner republics or the Boer republics which yeah. the Free State and Transvaal. It's just not rooted in reality. Yeah. And while all that talk was going on, Orania started something. Yeah. Now, in the end of the day, Orania is not about a tick list of qualifying. Yeah. It is an Afrikaner community. It is a Christian community. There's no doubt about that. But you won't, you might get in and into Orania on a tick list, on some legalities, on some, some small points, sure. catching out the system. But to live here is a different story. This is a, is, a, is a harsh place. It's a harsh climate. It's a harsh and stubborn people. Yeah. And to live here is something else. But friendly people. I can attest to that. Very friendly. Everyone greets. Everyone waves. Yes. Yeah. Because and it's very clean. We don't want enemies. We don't. We, 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 we're not a people. We, we, we want peace. But it's a stubborn people. Sometimes yeah. we're friendly with everyone else because we're having such a good fight with our fellow Iranians. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 Afrikaners are stubborn people yeah. and, and hard people. It's not easy living here yeah. every day. So getting through a tick list is not the way that you thrive in Urania. Embracing, embracing Afrikaner culture and those things. So, so that kind of that interview, I laughed at it too because it's not the way Urania does things. And it's not, it was not serious. Sure. Uh, it's, um, yeah, anyway. Meneer Joost Stradom, I'd like to thank you very much again for your hospitality, for allowing us to be here for the tour, for everything else. And thank you very much for joining us on the panel show. It was a privilege to speak to you because you're an open-minded individual and I can say that without just putting honey around your mouth. I know it's <laughs> true. It's um, some of the things that you saw today and commented on, some of the things that you remembered. I can see that you are you're also serious about problem solving, not about cheap political narratives. Yeah. Um, and I want to make a final call towards people. One, try to understand South Africa, we are Urania, because we understand our history and the country that we're in, in a specific fashion. Yeah. And the way that we understand our own history, the way that we understand ourselves and the way that we understand our country led us to a space where we know we must take responsibility. Yeah. And if we take responsibility for ourselves, we can encourage other people to do that. Afrikaners have a right to be on their own side, yeah. such as any other peoples or groups or so 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 associations or whatever in South Africa, be on your own side but build proactively and build with good intentions. And this, if you really try your best, then you won't fail and you will not be uh, in bad faith or in competition or in war with anyone else because good people doing good things, solution driven, will always reconcile their differences. And um, although different, although building their own space or whatever, they will not be in conflict with one another. Solution driven people are not necessarily at peace with one another. Just bye bye, thank you, Thank you.